I would prompt something, automatically click retry like three or four times, change one word, click three or four times, change another word, click three or four more times, generate tons of stuff and see where it takes me. AI is being used for scripting, for shooting and producing movies. AI is being used for everything. Forever. Hollywood Forever. production is being transformed by artificial, artificial intelligence. 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 Hello and welcome to the Curious Refuge podcast. We are really excited for today's episode because we have an AI rock star on the podcast. And I'm not just saying he's just a rock star when it comes to artificial intelligence and art. He's also literally a rock star that had a band for 25 years and toured all over. Uh, I am, of course, talking about uh, Matan Cohen Grummy, who is the founding creative director at Pika Labs. He really is a leading voice in this AI revolution, especially when it comes to AI advertising and storytelling. And on this episode, you are going to learn so much from Matan. So let's get into it. Matan, thank you so much for hopping on the podcast. Thank you guys for having me. I'm super excited to be here and I can't wait to see what we're going to talk about. I want to kick things off by really getting a sense of your background, what led you to using AI and kind of how did you kickstart your creative career? This is such a long story, but I will try to make it short. Starting uh, 26 years ago, <laughs> when I started a metal band, a rock metal band, and We've been at it for so long, but we had some real big success in the beginning of our career where we, where we signed with a major label. It was called Roadrunner Records. If there are any metalheads listening in. And so we were at the same label with Slipknot, Machine Head, um, Nickelback, and all those kind of bands. And we, we were just touring Europe constantly. Um, and it, it was kind of hard maintaining uh, an, an income being just a rock star. So... I turned into advertising. Start from the bottom of the of that industry, which was like I was a very base level graphic designer, working at uh, at the uh, ad agencies. Uh, I was I was always fascinated with video, so slowly I, I I transitioned into a video editor, then After Effects, like learning all the all the stages of of creating a video on the, on the way but always very, very close to advertising. So at some point around, I think, and the, the, band, the band was always going, like I was going back and forth from advertising to being a rock star. So at, uh, at some point, I think 10 years ago, I, or maybe 15 years ago, I decided that I, wanted, I, I just want to direct. So I just want to make videos the way I see them, my vision, my creative vision. And I started moving into the into being a TV commercial director. So, past ten years, I guess I directed something like a hundred um, commercials. At some point, I opened up my own production company that I still own in Israel called Willif Productions, which we do traditional TV productions. Um, Around, I, I think I first heard about AI when like they announced Mid Journey and I just or Dolly and I, I just read about it and like I was fascinated with like with the concept. I was like, wow, that that's sound amazing. You just type it in and and it and it visualizes it for you. This sounds amazing. And then when I first got like early access to to the Mid Journey, I think one of the first versions, the concept was still so impressive. But when I tested it out, it was like, hmm, maybe maybe later. <laughs> Uh, was playing around with it and then just put it aside. And I think around uh, last year, uh, around July, two things happened simultaneously. Um, one thing is my band was celebrating 25 years. And throughout the years, we kind of spread around. Everyone went to a different place, different country, different occupation. We still kept it going, like releasing albums every now and then. Um, but we were like active, inactive, and, and kept going. And uh, towards our 25th anniversary, it, it seems like everyone was in Israel. And I said, hey, guys, 25 years. We haven't played a show in like three years. I think what we should do is record that one last song, do a big-ass show in Tel Aviv, and kind of, you know, like sign off. Let's just say that that's it. 
And we planned that for like around July, I think, or, uh, and we did that. We recorded that one song. We had had this huge, like, goodbye, farewell show in Tel Aviv that was super emotional, super fun. Lots of people came. Um, but for that one song that we did, uh, we needed a video. And around exactly around that time, uh, I saw a very impressive sci-fi trailer on, on, on the net. And I was like, oh, wow, like, AI has, gone, has, has come a long way since, since I tried Midjourney for the first time. And I, I, I thought maybe now is a good time to get into AI. Again, we needed a video for that one song that we recorded. And I went and like spent three days on Mid Journey and like AI video platforms trying to make a, a music video. And it came out pretty good. I think it was okay. But I, I, I wasn't big on Twitter that day, on those days. I had like 12 followers and someone said to me, you should, you should go on Twitter. Like this is where everything is happening for AI. Like every, like the, the, the most um, fresh news, everything like the, the communities is really big there. You should try it out. I put that video on, on, on Twitter and it got a couple hundred thousand views. And, and that's it. The, the part with the band was finished. That was behind me. Like it did well. And I got so much excited about AI. Then I thought, well, if, if a, like, a, a, like a metal song with this dark, heavy uh, theme to it did so well, I kind of wonder what happened if I do exactly the opposite and have like pink cats with this cool, catchy hip hop song. I, I wonder how that will do. It's like exactly the opposite of, that, of my first experience with AI. And I remember watching one of your guys' tutorials before we even met. And you, you, you said something about upscaling. I took that. I, I kind of used that inside my, my next creation, which was those cats from Beverly Hills. And, and I think you were one of the, guys, the first guys to pick, that, pick, pick, pick up on that. And then I saw you, uh, saw my video on your uh, weekly updates. And I was like, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm pretty good at this. Maybe I should keep exploring. So that is the beginning. So again, I'm just trying to summarize it. This, this was my ticket into AI. But I've always been around arts and creative. And again, past 10 years, mostly as a creative and, and TV commercial director. And how did you go from that to getting connected with Pika? All right. So uh, after doing that, being in advertising, immediately I thought, well, the connection here is, is so obvious. Like I was, I was doing productions at the time. And I knew how, how much time does it take to, to have a long production for anything like it, it takes so 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 much time money and and resources and i i knew that ai wasn't ready to like make a full blown commercial at the same standard so i thought what would catch attention and can look j almost as good as the real thing and then i did this uh like this fake burger com commercial which turned out pretty cool like if you if you don't pay too much attention you can you might think this is the real thing and that's, that was my third, uh, my third uh, AI video. And this one really got blown out on Twitter. Again, I had like, I almost had, had like zero followers. It was starting to rise up a little bit. But uh, that was my first try of doing something that is more uh, ad-oriented in AI. And it did so well. And that got me, uh, one day I just got a, a message in my Twitter inbox from one of the investors for Pika who kind of introduced me to Demi and from there it's history. That's awesome, man. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's been cool because I, I think for us at Curious Refuge, we've seen your progression in real time, seeing some of those early projects. And then it felt like, you know, every other day we would log in and, and your work would be going viral and, and it was talked about around the industry. So we definitely like feel like you have this very unique place in the world of AI and creativity. And specifically that I would say there's, one project that really knocked my socks off in some of those early days, and it it was kind of the the one of the promo videos for the newer version of Pico, where you compared an old commercial that you shot using traditional techniques with uh, some of the similar generations using Pika, and some of the shots felt very similar. And I'm just curious, I guess if we explore that a little further, 
how are you thinking about using AI generated visuals in conjunction with live action content and, and how that fits into an overall commercial production as we move forward? I think like as the technology goes better and better, you can really see that, that there's a lot of room for AI uh, uh, using in, inside traditional production. I think the best use case for that was that video that Dave Clark made which was like half of it was live shot and half of it was like the more high production values. The stuff that was that is actually like more pricey to actually produce was done using AI and they blend seamlessly. And I think he just demonstrated that, that so well. And I think this will be like remembered as a turning point for what um, for what a good use case for, for this technology can be. And it's, you know, it's it's changing. Every, 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 it's, it's all the time changing because the better the technology gets, maybe the more room it has inside traditional production. And I guess like the, the holy grail is for it to replace it altogether. I don't think we're there yet. But what I was trying to do is figure out which product can it replace completely. And that's why I kind of did that burger commercial because it feels like, okay, no casting, no uh, complex reactions. It's just a, like a bunch of like vegetables and burgers flying around. That should be pretty easy. So, yeah, so that, that, that was like the way I, I perceived it. But I think it's, it's always changing. So we will see more um, interesting use cases for using AI in traditional productions. Yeah, and I love that you mentioned uh, one, Dave's project. Uh, I believe it's called Another. We're actually premiering that on our channel. Uh, it should be live by the time this podcast is live. So you can go check that out. I actually was having a conversation with the VFX supervisor of that project yesterday. And he was just talking about how different the process of working with AI is versus traditional pipelines. But having that background in traditional pipelines allowed him to contextualize AI and kind of its role in the creative process. And, and I think it's so interesting that you shared as well that you had a background in commercial production in using tools like After Effects, because I'm curious from your perspective, has that foundation allowed you to step into AI more like faster than someone who was starting completely from scratch? Yes. I think, you know, in my AI videos, it's like, I would say 30% about AI and then 70% about 20 years of expertise learning, like just being in the ad agency, ad, ad industry for like 20 years, learning storytelling learning offline editing, learning After Effects, learning all those different components of making video, those still translate when you're using AI. The only thing that changes is like how you produce your footage. So definitely having 20 years of expertise in making videos helped me make videos that stands out. And is it challenging? Have you found it challenging to keep up with all of the tools and how they're changing and, and then how that's changing your workflow every day? And especially being at Pika, I'm curious how that's, does it require you to kind of be on top of what's being released everywhere? And so that's informing maybe your product a bit. I, I have a good eye for like, for like filtering things. So there's so many things being released. I, I, to be honest, I don't, I don't stay and check every single one. When I see it, uh, uh, for my, from, from like my, my strategy for this is if I see another creator do something very impressive and I was like, oh, wow, how did he do that? Then I would go and explore, like, what did he use that was so different from up on what was, we've seen up until now. So I wouldn't be just blinded by, like, oh, a new toy to play with. I, 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 I would, I'd like to see results. Like, I'd like to see what can you, what, what can you actually do with it, you know? I, I totally agree. I think for as awesome as so many of the tech demos are, and I think the work that you're doing at Pika was showcasing what is possible with the tools. It's always really impressive. But those individual creators, you know, sharing those projects, like you just can't help but just like get instantly inspired. I feel like, uh, you know, you're talking about some of the early sci-fi trailers that were popping up. I feel like those early imaginings are really what inspired me to really start thinking about AI in a, a, a larger, you know, live action world building context, which, you know, is, does way more than just hearing about, you know, hey, we increased our... Uh, our knowledge tokens to a million and you're like, what does that even mean? Like, I'm not entirely sure like how to contextualize that. So it definitely feels like artists are, are leading the charge. It's so funny that, that, that just like um, keeping building on your point. It's so funny that like to think about it, like getting this amazing 
shot of like space with spaceships and like huge production value, something that would take like months to create is so easily done nowadays. But if you just want to have a face of someone just having the right reaction, saying the right word to make that look convincing, that's like pretty much still impossible. So it's it's just funny to think about it because, you know, I think this will dictate like how we will use that technology at different times of its evolution. I totally agree. It really feels like in these early days and kind of where we're going to be over the next few months is thinking about AI for world building, for establishing shots, for details, for setting the stage for those localized productions for humans to give the expressive acting performance. And so it, it's it's really just helping to drive down the cost because one of the most expensive parts of a film is the world building. Uh, and so it's just, you know, helping to to make uh, storytelling more financially viable, which is, I think, a very exciting thing. I, w- I want to circle back to something before we get into the bulk, because I want to talk about Pika and the innovations that you guys are doing over there. And I want to nerd out for a while about that stuff. But one thing that I think is so interesting, we had uh, Ian Sansavara on our podcast recently, and he's a creative educator in the AI space. And he also had a background in a band. And so I'm really curious, do you feel like there's something there where people who are in bands also like really creative, like are transitioning to using AI? Like, is there something going on there uh, that kind of leads you guys to explore AI? I think uh, a lot of musicians, you know, it's it's always revolves around arts, right? So within artist community, I think it's like half and half. Like uh, half of the artists will be so either intimidated or like just have this strong rejection to everything that's AI, and the other half will kind of embrace it and will be excited about it. I'm I obviously belong to the second half. Like when I saw it, I was like, oh wow, a new toy! I can't wait to play with it. Look what I did with it. And when I showed when I showed this to a lot of my musician friends, they were like, "What are you doing? Why are you doing that?" You know, I was spending so much time, like my free time, on creating fake burger commercials, and they were like, "Why are you doing this? What for? What is what is your end game?" And I was like, "Look how cool that is! I'm sure something good will come out of it. Come out of this, and I'm having fun, and I love it. So, like, look what I did in like eight hours. Isn't that amazing?" And I would just get those sour faces, but I guess it's like half and half. I, I maybe I kind of deviated from your question. I'm not sure, but no, I I like what you're saying, and it's interesting because, like Caleb, you were saying, musicians for some reason it feels like they're embraced motion design as well. Like we knew a lot of motion designers who were musicians, and then now AI, it feels like it's similar. Like you being a musician, Ian being a musician. I, I don't know if it's something about yeah that that art form transferring into like being able to edit and cut things and. Yeah, I, I think, things and yeah, it feels I, like you guys have a unique gift at doing that, especially musicians. You know, I think artists is, are, artists are artists, you know. So yeah. it, it, it's it's rare that an artist have only one art yeah. um, hobby, like just just I like just music. Usually, like some kind of visual arts, some kind of like sound. So, but like this, just judging on myself, when I hear AI music, I'm always like, mm, no, <laughs> so I'm, I think I'm more sensitive in that part. We've been having some fun generating some AI songs about our dogs, but <laughs> I am super curious, Mazan, like you talked about, you know, having some pushback from maybe friends and, and we've seen that a bit in our community as well, where people will create awesome work and then put it out into the world. And of course it's, there are some positive comments and then there's always folks who are um, discouraging as well about what they're creating because maybe the fear around AI and, and you know, that, that whole thing, but how how do you respond when you get negative feedback like that? I don't care. Uh, you don't honestly. care. <laughs> yeah, do you have like, any encouragement. That how would what would you tell a new creator who's putting their work out there for the first time and they're getting uh, a ton of negativity their way? I like getting feedbacks, but I'm I'm not thrown away by negative feedback. I try to to really dive in and understand where it's coming from, and from where I've been uh, like watching it, it seems like either. I, I can't can really grasp it because it's so, when it's negative, it's always it's usually very strongly opinionated. And there's like a real uh, hate for that. So when when I did that Saban uh, that that uh, demonstration side to side with those commercials, that I actually I actually directed the original one and did the 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 the, the AI version. Like some people asked me, 
why are you doing this? And I'm like, uh, first of all, it's coming, it's inevitable, and I don't think that talent uh, will be replaced. I think like I couldn't have made the, the, that AI version without all the talent from different people that was poured into that, whether it's editing, it's, it's, where the, you thought about the different art elements of it, um, camera angles, lighting, all that. I think it, it would just get kind of ball up to where it would become uh, more easy to produce, but you will still need tons of talent to create stuff that stands out. W whenever something it becomes so easy to produce, so easy to create, let's say you can create this commercial with a click of a button. What I always say that will happen is you will have tons of clutter of, the, of this what, like one push of a button commercials, and then you will still need a bunch of talented people to show you how you can make this stand out. So I'm, I'm not afraid of this change. And, and, and that's why I'm, I kind of always say it's inevitable. It's inevitable. Just kind of try to go with it, learn it, and see how you can contribute to, to make something that stands out. So this is what I say to people from my side of the, of the, of the of like from, from creative, that, that might have some small um, uh, resistance to it. And usually what I've seen is like, they were like, okay, that makes sense. And they went and kind of learned this, to use this stuff, these tools. And I think it's very useful. It, no matter from which a, a art industry you are right now, just experiment with it a, a little bit instead of just having this strong resistance and hate toward it. Just play around with this. You might like it. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I think that's really helpful advice. And, and we found that for folks that tend to be the most critical of AI, they're also the folks that tend to not test out the tools. I don't know too many people that are hypercritical that are actually in the weeds, like messing around with these tools. And I think when you begin to use the tools, no matter how awesome they are, you realize that there is a skill to getting the outputs that you are looking for. You know, as a creative director, I'm sure you can attest, having specific creative control over your outputs is a huge part of the creative process. And so it's not just type in a prompt and get a commercial or get a film. Of course, that technology, we've already seen prototypes of that technology and the films are very boring <laughs> and, they're, and, and they're not that interesting. Uh, so I, I think that's a really- That was exactly my thoughts, by the way. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's, it's like mid journey. It made the image creation so easy and we got washed by all those different major, major images. We see this all the time, but then every now and then you see, you see one and you said, oh, wow, that's beautiful. So, and you go and you see, okay, there's an artist behind it. Now, defining it as, a, as an art or not art, that, that, that doesn't matter. People can stand out using this. And it's, it, it's like, it's, it's obvious. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. And that, that interesting conversation about, is this art, is it not art? You know, obviously people have like different interpretations, but like we really feel like if something is created with human intention and someone projects a story onto it, then then that is art, you know, and you know, it, the work that, that we're creating using artificial intelligence, like the amount of skill that goes into creating those outputs, even if it takes less time, it's of course like still art and it's interesting and people find meaning in that. And I think that it's a, you know, it's just a new type of art form that we're learning how to interpret as a society. Exactly. For me, always the most interesting thing about AI videos was, and this is something that you guys are such big experts on is storytelling. Like that's the most important component and also uh, the most hard one to, to bring across when you try to do it. And for me, that was always, okay, here's the challenge. I have this story. How can I tell it using those very limited, like it's, it's like, I always say it's like, it feels like there are no limits, but there are so many boundaries. So it's, you have, you have all those uh, limitations in, in, in trying to, to convey a story. And I, I, I always looked at this as, as a challenge and that's what really got me into it. Oh, I, I managed to tell this story. Maybe I can try something harder. And I think that's just trying to figure out the way of telling that story. That was what's so interesting for me. Absolutely. Yeah. Storytelling is, is key. Where do you begin with building your stories? Like if you're, to, if you want to tell a story, like where does that start for you? Um, my mind is kind of weird in that term. Like I will never go through the usual channels. I like, I would never write a script, then try to execute it. And I think we all learned that that's also the hardest thing you can do with using AI. So 
what I would do, I, I go back and forth like a hundred times. I would have like, I would have like this vision. I would say, I want to see a girl and a cat. That's my story. And, and, and you might ask me, but what the concept? I'm like, we'll figure it out. Don't worry. And I'll start going. And sometimes you will, tr- you have a, you will have this thought and you will try to achieve it using AI, but then AI will say, mm, no, but it will give you something else. And that might spark some other part of creativity that will get, so I, I, instead of like being limited by it, I just kind of go with it and see where it led me. And when I feel like I have this, this concept that is good and the story is good, good enough, then I will say, okay, we have something here. And then I would kind of try and perfect that. So I will never have like the, the, the full plan. And even if I did, it will change like a thousand times during the process. <laughs> That really reminds me of kind of the tool two schools of animation, like the idea of pose to pose versus straight ahead. So, you know, animators like in the golden days of Disney, they're, they basically could approach their animation from two different ways. The first would be create the key, key uh, frames. Like literally that's where we get the term keyframes is. And they'd go from one to one and figure out how to interpolate between them. And the other was just to start with the first drawing and just kind of see what happens. And I think it's interesting to think about storytellers and some people like knowing the story beats and like how they're going to weave them together. And other people like starting from the scratch and just seeing what happens on the page or on the screen. And I, I don't think there's a right or wrong way. I think you can get some more creative ideas sometimes when you do the way that you're talking about, which is kind of just like hop in and see what happens. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah. I feel like sometimes I get inspired by the thing that I didn't want to achieve. So I, I wanted to achieve that, that particular thing but AI like wouldn't allow me or it was too difficult, but I, I, it, it kind of sparked something else. So I like, I think it's, for me, it was so natural because of all those limitations kind of go through those. Um, but that's just, that's just what was working for me. I guess some people will find a whole different way of like using those tools. Are there any stories that you have in your mind right now that you wish you had some time to tell, or you're looking forward to creating soon? Uh, like in my job in Pika, I, I, I jump between doing those feature videos, which I love doing. Like I love doing those, especially when they do well. So I like doing those because usually they don't um, they don't need a lot of storytelling, right? Because it's like it's like a, a some kind of show reel, or like. And I love doing those. Like this is what the kind of uh, I love storytelling, but I always like doing those thirty second blasts off, so like really cool stuff where every second is just a bomb. So like I, I was really drawn to this, so I love doing those. Uh, but when we're when we when I'm less uh, less busy with doing those, and we have some time, then my job is kind of just go creative, do whatever you want. And that's by the way a great place to be as a as an artist. And I sometimes do that. Like the last thing we did was uh, like that ferrets video. I know you guys saw it, right? I like, think it's, so. It's, I'm gonna look it up right now. The ferrets. <laughs> Yeah, it's just like this cool song, like 30, 40 seconds, <laughs> Ferrets doing hip hop. Oh. oh, I don't know if I've seen that one, but we'll totally. I, yeah. I know we'll... one, one of you guys definitely commented on that on our Twitter. Oh, okay. so, <laughs> well, it's funny. We have a we have a team of like seven people now. Uh, and yeah, everybody it's... loves like checking things out. But All right. Yeah. So, so th- like that was like kind of an off time. So I, I was doing that art project and it was. It's so we good. Have, like someone at the peak asked me, so what, what is, what, what is, what is next? What is your next art project? And I was like, I think a hip hop video with Ferris. I think that would look cool. And then we started exploring that and it became like really, really nice, like fine visuals. We had some key references and it just came out pretty cool, pretty cool. So that, that was that, you know? It's That's very awesome. cool. I love it. <laughs> I love that this is kind of your thing. Like, animal hip-hop animals with like a pink aesthetic you know it's... you know i i never thought about that and the cats video on the same uh, as as part of a series but after it was done and then realized I, I, i'll be honest i really like animals i love animals and i think one thing about ai and animals is i always say this it's like we as people we are very very sensitive first to our own face so if something changes a little bit you're very sensitive to it then you will be sensitive to people you know then you'll be less sensitive to people as a as a race, and then you will be less sensitive to animals. And some animals have this like alienish uh, behavior to them. That's why I did cats, by the way, for my second one, because cats are so 
aliens as, as it is. Like their movements is so random. So AI just complemented that so well. So besides loving animals, I think AI and animals are is a great combination right now. It's so funny. I was on my like, I don't know, Instagram's like real for you page, whatever. Um, was a cat video of like toasters going off and the way oh. cats would jump to the reaction of a toaster. Yeah, yeah, I know that one. Down. And they really are aliens. I mean, these cats were flying through the air and doing spins and backflips. And I was like, that's impressive. And then landing on their feet. So it's just inspiring. Like, yeah, be a cat. Yeah, yeah. In our AI advertising course, we have this like high fashion dog aesthetic. And so we made an entire music video with these like high fashion dogs. And we have like a custom song and it, it, it's like a whole thing. Uh, it's so, so good. yes, definitely big fans of using. AI to contextualize uh, animals and <laughs> it's, it sounds <laughs> like the 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 brother sister uh, video for the cats one because the cats one all the prompts was like high fashion couture Gucci Balenciaga like high brands ju just cats in brand yeah. fashion yeah so it's kind of sound like a similar concept yeah I think my brain we always talk about this like your brain uh, borrowing ideas unconsciously so in, yeah in comparison with AI even. Uh, but I'm sure I did the same thing, like seeing your work and it influencing the work that we do. It's so funny. I never shared these prompts, but I went down this series. I'm super into like fashion week. So whenever fashion week's happening anywhere, I'm like tuned in. I'm in all the like chat channels, like really engaged, but I'm into sweaters as well. And so I was prompting like sweaters in with like animals fused together. But that that sounds dark, but it was like knitted sweaters with like a knitted um, sheep coming off the but high fashion coming off the shoulder but it looked high fashion and so there's like you know very posed models with these like knitted sheep heads. cute animals on top of them <laughs> i need to share those because they're really cool but yeah it's so as fun as, it's fun as as just to use these tools to create just these really absurd <laughs> images yeah as long as it's not minx like uh yeah, yeah. yeah. fur coat then it's fine <laughs> it's not <laughs> made from the animals just all right that, that's great <laughs> That's that's what, that's what I was telling people about the burger commercial. It's like, hey, that's this is vegan. <laughs> I'm vegan, by the way. So, like, then I, when I finished that, I was like, oh my god, what have I done? And then I thought, oh shit, I need to to wrote one hundred one hundred percent vegan burger. Yeah. <laughs> impossible made from AI. <laughs> beyond yeah, <exactly. laughs> love that it, it like uh takes fake meat to a whole new level uh yeah. doing uh advertisements too <laughs> so there's kind of two areas that i want to go to before we wrap up because i know we've chatted for for quite a while already the first really is you as your title is founding creative director at pika labs yeah. and i think that's a really interesting title and I, I think I'm just personally curious because it feels like Pika has this very unique way in which it presents itself to the world. And, you know, talking about the ferret music video and some of the the demos that you've created, it does, I think, have a, a great amount of contrast to other tech demos that we see around the industry. So I'm just curious from your perspective as you're developing the Pika brand and laying out a creative direction like what do you hope to accomplish with the style that you are bringing to pika and then how does that reinforce the uh the overall vision that pika has i know that's like a really big question so feel free to yeah, like kind of break actually it. not it makes a lot of sense i I, I, would, I would say this is kind of my responsibility right like i came here to do that feature video that got so very popular and viral on twitter got 20 million views and my strategy was like we we can't be just another company showing look this impressive thing it has to be fun it has to be catchy it has to be it has to look like for everyone because that's kind of where we're aiming as a company we want to be for everyone we're not aiming just as a professional industries we want everyone to have fun with this tool like everyday consumers everyone who has a little bit of fascination with video can kind of hop on and try creating something cool so that video was also a lot inspired by that thought. So how can we make, make this eye catchy, eye candy, cute, funny, overwhelming uh, thing? And I think, I think we, we've achieved pretty good at that. And, and I'm trying to maintain that. We, we're trying to maintain that approach while adding different layers to it. So like we also released those tutorials where like 
maybe a little bit slower and more explanatory, but but we will always try to give out this like bombs of visuals that kind of try drags everyone in them and excited about this and excited the product because it's an exciting product and we want to get people excited about it. I love that. And I feel like at Curious Refuge, we're, we're at a similar place because we feel like what's happening with these AI tools, it's democratizing creativity and allowing you to not only emulate, you know, fantastic, you know, highly cinematic IMAX, crazy quality visuals, but also give everyday people the ability to tell stories, to have fun, and to do these side experimental projects that maybe you've already uh, always dreamed of creating. And, and so it seems like there's a bit of a of, of visual and a tonal overlap between Curious Refuge and, and Pika. And so it's been cool to, to see kind of some of the, the similarities there. I agree. Like, I just like trying to tap in into my thought, like when I was generating clips, I, I, I remember I had like three thoughts in mind when I did that video. I, I always wanted to, first of all, um, like you guys, you do storytelling and you do it so well, but this is your product, right? You, you learn, you teach people how to create stories. Uh, right now, we're at the point of we're doing those clips so you can make your own story. So I was thinking about all these random clips, but keeping in mind, like I want every single clip to have something creative about it. And I wanted to look good. I wanted to have good motion and I wanted to be some kind of creative. So like, I, I tried generating things that I'd never seen before. So like a raccoon in space trying to catch a burrito, that sounds like something that might be fun. So I was trying just to tap into that that line of thinking and just, just generated a bunch of those. Yeah, it, and I feel like, like what we were talking about earlier, whenever you begin to play around with these tools you have those creative imaginings and it's not something that you could have just like went to a pen and paper and like thought up and then like you just like you sit down and you start messing around and, and those things uh, inevitably yeah. happen yeah let, let it inspire you sometimes i think that's a great strategy now the the next area that i really want to explore i feel like you were one of the very first people in the industry to begin thinking about using ai for commercial projects like even for example we got connected with Ike, uh, who now works at Curious Refuge, he said he was doing work with you uh, yeah. very early on. Uh, like yeah. this is like I, I believe late summer of 2023. Like a lot of AI tools were just coming around. So I'm curious if you could just share some insights, especially because you have so much experience in commercial advertising. Yeah, how, um, how do you go about like pitching to clients the use of AI and where does it fit in with the creative process as it relates to bread and butter working on paid client projects? I would say a few things. Um, one thing is most of the time when the clients approach me and they will say, ah, oh, we want to do this but with AI, I will tell them, don't, that's a bad idea. And the reason why is they come with this idea that they already had and they just want to do it with AI. And in like 90% of the cases, I will tell them this idea uh, produced like this will create a mediocre product. And the reason is if you want to use AI to make an, uh, a commercial, you need to think about it from the, from the very beginning. You need to think what will what, in, in what way will producing this using AI can complement the product and not just be a way you know, for a means. Um, yeah. So, so I, I find myself a lot of time just kind of saying, don't, that's a bad idea. Don't use AI for this, but I can take your concept and rewrite it completely and then say this, this will look great in AI. And we can do that if you want. So about Ike, for example, uh, like I started, like I said, before, before I started in Pika, there was a, this few months of transition, um, where I was doing those AI commercials for clients. And one term that I always kept is like, uh, I'm in charge of the creative. Uh, don't, don't give me a script and just tell me do this with AI. Cause in most cases, that just be mediocre, mediocre. You have to think about this from the very beginning. Like, okay, what's your brand? What's your idea? What's, what, what, is, what, what do you want to say? What is your message? Let me take that. Think how can we deliver that message but with creating something clever that AI will complement you and not be just uh, 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 something that limits us. And second thing I always tell clients is I, I think it's super important when you work with clients 
on an AI project is explaining those limitations. Like managing clients' expectations is super important because most of the people, most of the clients, they just want to hop on the AI hype and save money because they think that it's cheap. So most of the cases, they will just bring the same old idea and just make it with AI. We want this AI. And you kind of need to educate them and explain to them what is the limitation, why this might work, why, why, why might this not work. And exactly for that reason, why is this a bad idea, mm. but this might be a really good idea. Right. Yeah. And show examples, show like references, say, look, this was done with AI. Look how good this is. We can do something like that. I want to do a little bit of role playing here because I'm curious about how you specifically would communicate this to a client. So let's say that I was a client and I come to you. I'm very blunt. Okay, great. So I'm like, all right, I'm like, uh, here, you know, I have this crazy idea for like this commercial where like there's like all these animals and they're like flying through the clouds and they're like in high fashion or whatever. What, uh, what are those limitations? How would you communicate those limitations? I would say this sounds like a pretty good idea for AI. For AI. It seems like you got it. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. So, so how would this experience it, for me as a client coming to you, how would you communicate the differences in those workflows and uh, how would this be different than my traditional workflow with typical ad agencies? Well, in traditional, in traditional workflow, you have control over every little detail and that does two things. It gives you that, that so many feedbacks that you can actually work on and make perfect, but it also takes a lot of time and a lot of money. And when you transition that workflow to AI, it's completely different because you will get something good. And I will tell my clients, if we got something good that it's working, but you just want to change that one thing, think about it. Yeah. Because maybe if, we, if you got something that's good, slip on it, see if it's if for the next if the next day it still feel good, and flow with it. Because sometimes you would do the, all those iterations and you end up with something much much less uh, not not as good, and. You know, hey, AI, like when it hits, it hits. And yeah. if you feel like it hits, like 95% hit, 92% hit, go with it. And what does it look like for you when you're first partnering with a brand? Do you ask for their brand book, for their font, the fonts they use, the colors they use? And then what does it look like for you to take an existing brand that has an established like look and sense of design and, and work with AI to create, you know, advertising. I think uh, in, in advertising, there are like this, there's two different parts. There's the creative part where you can go wild. And that's a great place for AI. And there's this, the, the, the product side. And you always have to keep the product side what it is. So if you have to do the product uh, part, uh, traditionally, uh, you do that. You keep the, you keep the branding, you keep, the, keep where, where you communicate your message that is that has to stay the same and also clients are very sensitive toward their product and their brand so you can ch you can play around with that part that part has to stay as it is and you have to respect that part creative the part that leads to that message that part you can go wild and ai is a great tool for doing that so before we get into kind of our, our rapid fire questions at the end here, uh, I want to take a little bit of time to really focus on Pika. So you probably use Pika perhaps more than anyone in the world. Uh, so I'm really curious, do you have any really practical tips and tricks for working with Pika, maybe getting maximum quality or some things that you've learned over the last few weeks or months that uh, would be helpful things for people to know? I think uh, one tip that I would give uh for AI creators as a whole, not just for using Pika. Yeah, uh, you know, one thing that is, that is fascinating about about AI creation is it's like it's always somewhat of a gamble, right? And I see people getting frustrated when they don't get exactly what they want. And for me, when I compare that to traditional filmmaking, it's like so much more fun. Because let's say I have this idea for one shot, right? When you try to achieve that using traditional filmmaking, you would go out to shoot it. You will do like 30 takes of this exactly the same thing. You come back to the editing room and then you watch 30 takes of the same shot, trying to find that exact perfect shot and that exact perfect moment in, the, in that shot. And in the AI, it's such a different w workflow because what you do, you create 30 different uh, ver uh, variations of that shot. This is so much more fun in the process. 
and leaving 90% of those, uh, those, those uh, variations on the floor, as we like to call it, on the editing floor, that's fine. That's part of the process. So never get frustrated by this. Just, just be thankful that you don't have to see the, exactly the same shot 30 times. I think this is such a, a, fun, a fun workflow, and it's so much, so much better in, in so many ways. So I don't, I don't let, I don't let it um, frustrate me. I just understand that's part of the process, and I just generate a lot of footage, keep generating, 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 until the, I find the one that I feel like, oh, this is a hit. Yeah, and, and that's something that we communicate all the time. You know, When you're looking at an AI tool, really try to find some that will help you do those iterations and run multiple prompts at once. And I think that's one thing that Pika does really well. It allows you to run multiple things in the back end so yeah. that you can use someone else's GPUs to render that stuff out. Whereas before, if you're running a local thing, you know, you're, you're, you know, bogging down your own machine and you're creating a bottleneck for yourself. So I think it's pretty cool to, to think about. Um, yeah. So, you, you know, I, I feel like I haven't answered that uh, question in a very practical manner, but exactly just to elaborate on what I said before, I would prompt something, automatically click retry like three or four times. Change one word, click three, four times. Change another word, click three, four more times. Then after like one or two minutes, I have like those 20 different shots. If I find the one I like, I will obviously pick it. Otherwise, I will say, oh, this bunch seems like it's going to a good direction. So I think achieving that perfect shot with Pika, like on, on the website, it's just so much easier and faster. And that's exactly what I'm doing. I just, I just work on the website and generate tons of stuff and see where it takes me. And before, before that, it was very, I think before we had Pika, like doing that on Discord would take forever. And that just sped up my workflow so, so much that it's, uh, I think this is one of the strong points. And I think when I first saw that retry button and that carousel, the first thing I, th I said, wow, guys, this is brilliant. Yeah, like this is brilliant work. I, I, I can see how this is going to speed up the, the, the workflow and the process of so many creators. This is a great idea. I was like blown away. So with good. And now having lip sync speeds it up even more, which is incredible. Yeah. I'm yeah. super excited about lip sync. Yes, that definitely like lip syncing, character consistency. There's like some core problems that uh, the AI world is is working through right now. And, and once we get uh, some of those issues resolved, the storytelling is going to be yeah, exponentially easier and more accessible, which is very exciting. Awesome. Well, I think we're going to transition into some rapid fire questions. So if you listen to uh, this podcast, you know how it works. So I'm going to kick it over to Shelby. This question is quite long for rapid fire. So let's see. Uh, so as someone who is pretty high profile in the creative industry, what is the coolest experience you've had? This could be people you've met, things you've been able to do. What is just Top of mind, what's the coolest experience? I think just like what I kind of told you guys in the beginning, like I, from having like 20 years in t sitting in Tel Aviv and then just kind of playing around with AI and by the third video I put on Twitter, just getting noticed and now I'm here. That's pretty much a, a mind-blowing experience to think about like when you, when you think about it. So I think this is it for me. <laughs> this is one for me. Yeah, love it. When you feel overwhelmed or unfocused, what do you do? Oh, I hate saying this, but I go outside and vape. There's, um, I listened to Jay Shetty and he was talking about how to help with our focus. There's like three W's. It's walk, water, and window. So when we're feeling like we we're having a hard time getting back into the flow of things, like during our breaks, take a walk, get some water, go stare out a window. Because truly getting outside and stop, like not staring within this like space that we have between us and our computer but like having, using our vision to kind of stare off into space, looking further out, it does do something to like reset our brain. So I think if I, if I have to give like a better answer than that, sometimes there's a, there's a sentence that says, creative people need time doing nothing. Yeah. That's part of the process. And sometimes if I'm like, I have this brief, you need to come, to come up with a, the, 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 the solution for this nothing good will come out of it. But if I just like kind of sit around and not think about it, right. then something will pop up. And then from that, the moment that you got tapped into an idea that you can visualize in your head and you know it's good, the, 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 the path from that to getting a kick-ass product is so easy. 
So that moment is the most important part. And sometimes it's the most challenging part of the work. Yeah, it's like it's like moving meditation. I don't know. It's like getting in a car, going on a run, these kind of like getting out of your computer. Just letting go. Just being. Sometimes the most creative ideas come from yeah, that yeah. kind of just being in the world and not having to be doing. So I totally so, agree with you. For me in creative, when I try to crack something open, it will never open. Yeah. But if I let go, it's like, like, like I won't think about it at all. Then it's like, oh, yeah, right. Like right. This. Caleb and I, I feel like half of, I mean, Curious Refuge really was like this, the company was basically founded on hikes in LA, just like going on hikes, walking. Um, that's where we had most of our ideas for everything we've built, I feel like. Either waiting in line so, at Disney or going on a hike. That's like... Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a much healthier way than mine. <laughs> I am not hating on your vaping. I love it. <laughs> okay. That's fine. You can. It's a, it's a, it's a disgusting habit. <laughs> um, cool. Let's see. So are there any big announcements from Pika that we should expect this year? Always. Nonstop. Yes, but that's all I'm going to yeah. go say. <laughs> yeah. oh, cool. And then I would love to know, as a, a rock star, what is your favorite band? Oh, that's such a hard, that's such a hard question, because I like so many different genres. So one of my all-time favorite band is ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Slayer, Pantera, and then No Effects. And uh, I think five is fine right now. And I see this. Yeah. Have you got to meet any of those bands while uh, you were on tour? Uh, we were on tour for like a month with Sepultura, which is also a band that I really like from Brazil. So I was lucky to find that. We did meet Slayer like twice. That's so we were cool. Playing with them in Germany and Slovakia. I was so young. That, that's, that's like actually 2006. So uh, quick math, 18 years ago. A long time ago, yeah. But at one point, I realized I don't want to meet any of my uh, like favorite bands. Yeah, I don't want to. Just want to because you you meet some of them and some of them are assholes. And then you're like, yeah, just let's just, just, just keep it about the music. What, what do I care if he's a nice guy or not? So funny. So Caleb and I started a band when we were teenagers. Really? We did. I would love to hear that. It was. It, it's so bad. It's. <laughs> <laughs> Caleb's dad. Let me, be the, let me be the interviewer for once. How long have you guys been together? Uh, I love this. So weirdly, and like a lot of people don't know this. Like we are married, Shelby and I. Yeah. Oh, did I just burn you? But did I just, did I just out you guys? Yeah. <laughs> How dare you? We, no, it's great. We've been married for over twelve years. Uh, so been married a long time and dating for just over fourteen years. Yeah. Uh, Together for 14 years but we've known each other for i think since i was probably 12, i met you i met you when yeah. i was in fourth grade but it was only on one random trip but i officially met you i feel like and became friends when i was 12 so yes but but you've been a rock star longer than we've known each other which is <laughs> that's amazing you know. <laughs> I, I love I love the direction this interview is taking. Yeah, <laughs> this is the fun part. <laughs> Let's talk about you. Yeah, exactly. How are you? <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much, Vatan, for hopping on the podcast. I, I really appreciate it, and and thank you so much for the work you're doing, not only at Pika, uh, but just for the larger creative world in general. I think it's very helpful work. I, I think it really helps to contextualize and give people excitement towards uh what is happening so uh hopefully we uh can can meet together in person sometime soon and i guess before we send folks off is there any way that people can see more of your work and get to to know you online where should we uh, direct people to uh yes i have i, I think the m most two places that i update the most are instagram and twitter so uh, it's Instagram slash Matan Koengumi or Twitter dot com slash Matan Koengumi. Just my name, which is hard to spell since it has like fifteen letters in it. But I'm sure you guys get it. We'll add all the links. So, all right, that 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 would be easier. Yes. Than <laughs> just spelling it out. How do you say that, Matan? It's like, 
<laughs> always always a hard Matan AI at this point. You probably have enough SEO juice to be the first Honestly, thing that pops up. I think so. Yeah, but 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 ego. I want my name. Search you know, uh, yeah. AI hip hop ferrets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's also a way. That's also a way. Hey, it works. Awesome. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you guys so much for having me. I had a great time talking to you, and uh, I feel like every time we kind of have this small uh, get together online, it's like uh, so glad to see you guys. Oh, same, honestly, same. and we'll have to connect in person. Hopefully this year. I I imagine there will be something that brings us up towards you or you to LA. We got to figure sure that out. Next time I'm in LA, I will definitely drop you guys a hundred percent. Yeah, love it.